We're dealing with people, so occasionally there can be misalignment. That happens in any business in the world that, that is involving in the sourcing of people. So we've got to watch that very, very carefully, uh, both from an expectations point of view or occasionally, again, if there is misalignment, we have to, you know, be on the front foot, if you like, in managing that. Welcome to the Agency Hour podcast, where we help web design and digital agency owners create abundance for themselves, their teams, and their communities. That's right, abundance beats scarcity every single time. This week, we're joined by Drew LaForcha. Drew holds an executive MBA, has over 10 years' experience working with offshore teams, and as general manager of Connect OS, now heads up the Australian and New Zealand regions responsible for client relationships and business development. In this episode, we dive into the challenges around sourcing staff, the business model for a staffing solution company, how to filter out bad talent and attract good talent, and which offshore roles agency owners should be exploring. I'm Troy Dean. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Agency Hour podcast, Drew LaForcia. Hey, Drew, how are you? Good, Troy. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Uh, A little bit of background. Just give people the too long, didn't read version. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you here on the Agency Hour podcast? Sure. So, uh, yeah, as you said, I, I work for a company called Connect OS. I'm a general manager there, basically responsible um, for you know client management, client development in Australia and, and New Zealand at the moment. We're expanding to other markets as well. Um, and why am I here? I was. I hope I've answered all the questions, Troy. But I'm <laughs> by uh, well, Josh Moore, Duo Plus. We, we've done a bit of work with them in sourcing candidates um, for our model, which is offshore staff based in the Philippines in a managed services model. Great. So yep. let me just unpack that. Josh Moore, for those listening, is one of our Mavericks Club Mastermind members. He was looking to expand his team. When he first started working with us, uh, he frankly didn't have enough people uh, on his team and he uh, had never used team offshore at that point, I don't believe. Yep. So we encourage him to explore this. He went digging. He found you guys. You guys are a Star, integrated resource solution is what it says on your website, but you're a staffing solution company for people, companies who want to hire and grow a team in the Philippines, which has a whole bunch of, having been there and done it myself, a whole bunch of headaches and a whole bunch of problems that you're going to have to solve along the way. Right. You guys solve a lot of those problems for your clients and just match your clients with staff in the Philippines, correct? Correct, yeah. So um, first of all, how did you – get into this. I know we were talking a little bit about this pre-show, but just give the audience a, a rundown. How did you get into this business model? Yeah, so thanks for us. So again, sort of very high level. I've got been showing my age a little bit here, but over 20 years experience in, in you know, business development, relationship management, and through that um, I worked for a company, quite a well-known publisher called LexisNexis, well over 10 years ago now, um, and they went down the path like a lot of Australian companies on outsourcing their administration team at the time. So I was in a sort of senior role managing that um, got a feel for it day to day, really saw the, the value in doing it. Um, and then through other, other roles, again, I was in a GM role managing a, managing a team offshore and built close relationships. So again, had got more of a grassroots feel. Um, and then the Connect OS opportunity came up about three years ago for me. Um, you know, very exciting journey as a business, given the level of growth. You know, it was a, um, the sort of short version there when I started, as I touched on Troy, we were at about 130 staff. On our books, and now three years later, we're approaching twelve hundred. Wow! Um, you know, we're on the BRW number twenty ninth, I believe, uh, last year, and um, and you know we've got some other. Well, we're now the, the number one ranked. Not to plug the business too heavily, but number one ranked based on Job Street and in, Indeed, which is um, relevant because that's that's um, assessed by what employees think of us rather than mm. you know, other corporates. So that that's plays an important role in us attracting the right candidates. So I'm very passionate about the space, Troy, and, and, you know, it's very exciting and I think it's where the world's heading for a lot of lot of companies. Totally. I mean, this COVID's really accelerated this, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, everyone's heard a horror story. Everyone's – a lot of people listening to this podcast have been through a horror story of trying to hire staff, whether it's local or remote, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's Indonesia, whether it's, you know, South America, wherever, whether it's next door in the next street. Uh, what, what are some of the challenges if, if people are like, and, and maybe, you know, Josh is an example, people are just getting into this for the first time. What, what are some of their blind spots, the things that they're not thinking about that they should be? Um, and, you know, again, not to plug your business too much, but maybe how, how do you help them with those? How do you help them accelerate that journey and not have to kind of go through that those challenges on their own? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think I, I'd, I'd probably answer that in two levels. One, 
um, I guess as an industry, we, we absolutely deal with those perception issues. No question that there, there are, you know, that there are reputations on cowboys, some cowboys playing in our space. Um, that is absolutely something we have to deal with and, and understand we've got to push through that as a brand. Um, part of it too, I'd say, why is, well, firstly, why is that perception there? There have been issues, I think, on a lack of transparency. Um, in the industry, and that's something we're trying to address in our model. So, number one, as an example, if we if you're using a service like ours, um, you get charged lump sum amounts, and you have no idea what you're really paying for within that. And then there was, there was an issue recently, I gather, that, that where there was, I'll just say, big end of town, and there were some things that came out, and they realised there was some some let's just say gouging going on. And I won't say more than that. So, transparency can be a lack of issue, and we've certainly you know, try to address that now model with being very transparent on what we charge, what the employee mm-hmm. earns and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, to come on, on your question on, on, I guess, some of the challenges around it, I think there, certainly with, with people that go direct, so as opposed to using a model like ours, if people go and try and source staff direct on sites like Upwork and other equivalents, um, you know, there are risks around that and that in some ways can tarnish the whole space because it, there are things that can happen. You can get very good staff, but equally these issues around people working two or three roles at once is one mm-hmm. example, disappearing after three months and you really don't have any any recourse because it's a different legal jurisdiction. Um, so those things can, again, tarnish the whole industry. Um, part of the value in what, what not just us but providers like us where you are employing them under local labour law contracts means they can't be working two or three jobs at once. You don't tend to disappear after after three or four months, um, so that offsets some of that. But, again, you're dealing with those perception issues. Um, Troy, I think, can, can be part of it. And I think beyond that, look, I, I, you know, as you say, I don't want to be plugging us too heavily, but there, there, it is quite involved in, in setting up a, a business in the Philippines, and um, certainly the founder is more the expert here than me, but... Um, Understanding that there's just it's just difficult to set up a, an offshore business. There's a lot of uh, different processes, and there's things take longer than you think. Mm. Um, you know, I think the investment we put in our business on attracting the right candidate that that takes time. You know, and you're you're dealing with one of the values of what we do as a low cost resource. So, if you like, you have to play the longer game. You can't charge huge money, but but it takes time to build that brand. At the same time, you, you can't and you wouldn't want to up your rates to you know, increase cash from the short term to make ends meet. So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a tightrope for any business, I think, starting out in this space in the first few years. Mm. I mean, it makes sense. So so just to be clear, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I've have been to Manila, you know, several times. Yep. Uh, I've hired staff over there and we've fired staff over there. I have uh, friends over there who run BPOs in the Philippines. It is a different world um, because you are, as you say, you, you, you know, you're not dealing with the same bureaucratic structure that you might be used to dealing with in Australia or the US. Um, and you're right, someone hires someone in the Philippines on Upwork and they go missing after three weeks and all of a sudden they say, oh, well, I tried to hire someone in the Philippines and it didn't work, right? Yep. It's like someone who launches, launches a Facebook ad campaign and the first campaign doesn't work, so they say Facebook ads don't work. Hmm. One of the most profitable companies on the planet, their whole business model is advertising and you're trying to tell me the Facebook ads don't work. Yep. It's not that Facebook ads don't work, it's just that you haven't figured out how to get them to work for you. So the... Uh, the I think there's a lot of fear and I think there is – and also it just ends up going in the too hard basket, right, because oh. it is um, – now Now one of the things that I, I know from personal experience is that it takes a bloody long time to find and onboard good talent into your business. As I said, whether you're hiring them in your own office or on yeah. the other side of the planet. And I think – and again, we're not here to plug Connect OS, but, but the reality is you're in this business – uh, one of the advantages of using a service provider like yourself is that this is your core business. You're, do, you're recruiting, you know, lots of talent on a daily basis and you are, you know, top towel is another example of, I mean, they, they will publicly say they only hire, you know, the top 3% of the talent. So obviously you're, you're paying a premium for that talent and their infrastructure, but you're saving time having to go through that process yourself. Well, what I'm curious about is what do you do? How do you filter out the good talent from the the not so good talent, and and what do you do to attract those people to Connect OS? Because it's there's a lot of there's a lot of providers like you. There must well, be there must be dozens of places, hundreds of places where talent in the Philippines can go to try and get these opportunities. How are you attracting good talent for your clients? Yeah, good, again, very good question. So 
I, I, I'll, so the two parts of the question, I'll, I'll talk, I guess, in terms of our process and then the brand, because I think they they are separate points. Um, the brand being, again, how do we attract the right talent? And I'll unpack that a little bit, but on the, on the process. And, and some of these, these responses, Troy, I, I don't want to... Um, I mean, they are going to be sort of common sense things I'll, I'll say because, you know, the, yes, you know, you do need good staff in the recruitment team that know what they're doing, that understand the market, and, you know, you, I don't, as I'm sure your audience would expect. Um, but but there is some nuance around that on on how they, you know, literally how they go about screening cam, you know, campaigns. You know, the communication piece, funnily enough, is that there's actually very good comms, you probably know, in the Philippines across the board, but understanding some of the nuance on certain roles, especially in marketing is a good example, actually, where, um, you know, you, you do need to look below the surface if it's SEO and there's, you know, you look look at scripts and so forth. So having a really strong recruitment team that understand the market, you know, kind, kind of goes without saying. Um, look, I, I think, and it's weird, in some ways it would be good to have a recruiter on the call with me because they, they can go <laughs> on some of the nuance, but, but you know, they, they, they do manage that process really well. On, on the brand, on attracting the right talent, um, you know, the, 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 I could unpack that a lot, but there's, there's starting with the, the basics. So where we're located, for example, now, parts of Manila, BGC, Makati are good examples um, where they're actually, I gather, ex-military grounds that were converted to office space over time. Um, nothing wrong with that. They're, they're good precincts, but depending on the staff, they're not necessarily as accessible as other parts of Manila. Um, we have deliberately located in Mandialong, which is right next to the Edsa Freeway, um, so very accessible from public transport and, and driving into the office. That's a, that's a big deal in a city like Manila. Mm, it's totally. You know, most populated city in the world, um, densely populated city in the world. So so that, that's a big part. Now, even the office room, it's there, the mega mega tower in Edsa, that's a really, it's a really high-quality building. So it's a great environment for the staff to be in. It's fully, it's not surrounded by concrete, natural light. You know, the offices are really kitted out as good as what you'd see in Melbourne or, or any other you know, major city in Australia. So they're on proper, you know, great working conditions, 120 centimetre desks, large flat screen TVs. Um, you know, we do a lot of, well, we're a very strong HR focus in the team. And it's I do occasionally say this in conversations with potential clients, and but the, the idea that internally, you know, there is absolutely a focus on looking after the team. But as I say, how does that play out in practice? So the, these team building activities on a monthly basis, often staff that might only be one staff for a company, a group with others in a similar industry, so they feel like they're they're, they're part of it. Um, you know, the fact that we're located above the mega mall is a big deal from a local point of view. And so the mega mall is the sixth largest shopping centre in the world, I gather. Because if you think about their lifestyles, Troy, they they start earlier than us. They're two or three hours behind, behind depending on what time of the year it is. So they typically start early. Finish early, they go straight down from the mega tower down to the mega mall, do the shopping and go home. So these are big draw cards from a lifestyle point of view in terms of getting the talent. Um, you know, other, these sound like little things in isolation, but things like having a masseuse. Um, it sounds cute, but again, they, these are all little draw cards. So, you know, all these sort of pieces add up to what, why are we getting, you know, ranked right now, the number one based on Job Street, just owned by Seek. These are credible things. So they really do look at that in terms of which managed service provider they're going to work for. Um, and that, that sort of, you know, com- completes the picture. And they have choices, right? They, they, they Absolutely. like, they, 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 there is an abundance of opportunity for, uh, for Philippine talent at the moment because, uh, you know, companies in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, the UK are looking for talent. There's obviously uh, not only economic benefits, but there's also just popular, like there are just numbers, right? Like hmm. I talk I talk to agency owners all the time and explain why the Philippines I think is a good option because in Australia, like not only economically does it make sense, but just th- think about the numbers. In the Philippines, a lot of people are skilling up in order – to provide services to Australian and New Zealand companies. Mm. In Australia, we're not skilling up to provide those same services, right? And it's and it's just it's it's a numbers game. It's not just the cost of living over there allows us to have an economic benefit. It's purely the numbers. Well, the talent pool, I believe the talent pool is bigger over there with the kind of skills that we need to support our business operations. Yeah, absolutely true. I think it, it just just following on your point, there's sort of a couple of insights I, I would share um, that might be of value. I mean, firstly, the idea, you know, that 
it's off, often the tendency can be to think in terms of a role rather than just just standing back from your own business and thinking about okay, what are what are the things that are taking away core staff, senior leaders away from high value tasks, right? So thinking in terms of functions rather than worrying about what the role might look like is a helpful way to do it. So because it's very common, we'll see local businesses grow rapidly because they, they get their senior team together and say, okay, guys, but you know what you, you all know what your core remit is and what's taking away from that. And for those functions, how do we outsource that? And then, mm. you know, companies like us and where we feel we can add some value, we can really consult on that and say, well, based on that, we think that's, you know, one, two roles, whatever it might be. But again, because you can get hybrid skill sets within the one resource. And that's often another thing people don't realise. You can get someone who's a social media marketing manager, as an example, also doing some general office admin. So I think from a, as you say, talking in terms of global trends, the idea that that question, are your team spending enough time on the high value tasks, freeing them up, what does that mean? What's the role-on effect of that, right? So therefore they've got more time to allocate to high value task strategy, whatever it might be, okay? Um, it's just a helpful way to think of it. The other insight I, I would share that I really, I have absolutely was enhanced for me at Connect OS beyond my, my other roles um, is the idea that you can really find resources or people that aren't just disciplined, hardworking, turn up on time and, and follow instructions. There's really good soft skills there. So strong EQ, right? The ability to, like our CSMs, client relationship managers, they have to read between the lines. You've got these com- conversations around whether it's terms, legal or more nuanced conversations, and again, you can get that sort of talent because, as you say, it's a, it's a cornerstone of their economy, so they're really gearing up for that to be an absolute, you know, have been for a long, long time, you know, key service to offer. So, um, yeah, it's evolved a lot, I would say, is too in the last 10 or 15 years. Now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking uh, that you want to grow a team but you don't want the responsibility of having your own team members or you don't have time to figure that out just yet because you're just inundated and overwhelmed with work that you need to get done, one option may be to just use a white label development partner to get those client projects done. And over time, you might discover that you have more free time to think about growing your own team, in which case using someone like Connect OS might be a good solution. But in the interim, or maybe you just don't want the responsibility of managing your own team and you just want to outsource everything to a white label dev agency, totally fine. In that case, you should definitely talk to Manish and the team at E2M Solutions. They are our uh, sponsor here on the podcast. They're also our platinum sponsor for our MavCon events. There's a, a hundred thousand reasons why they are our sponsor. And I can tell you now, we have been offered sponsorship for years on this podcast from everyone And his dog in the web design space, all the big brands that you would expect have approached us for sponsorship and we have continually turned it down because I want to be able to talk on this podcast about what is best for you guys and not feel beholden to say something specific because our sponsor is, you know, allowing us to do this and and funding us. Uh, The good thing about E2M is I do have complete creative control over this podcast. We can say whatever we want in this podcast. And also uh, we just have such a value alignment with the guys at E2M that it made perfect sense to bring them on as a sponsor. Their business model is different to Connect OS. They are a white label development agency that will do all of your care plan work, all of your development work. They'll also do some copywriting and they'll do uh, some SEO they manage the projects in your system. They manage their team. Uh, it's you know pretty much a plug and play system that allows you to move very quick and get some stuff done without too many headaches. Uh, so e2msolutions.com slash agency dash mavericks is where you should go to check that out and start the conversation with Manish. And they will very kindly give you a discount off your first month to get you on board and get you started. We have many clients using them. Uh, I'm also interacting with them at the moment because I'm helping one of our clients out who is unwell. I have dived in and I'm helping him get some projects over the line. And so I'm actually project managing some projects at the moment and uh, working with the guys at E2M to get some projects done. I can tell you the quality of work is outstanding and their communication is excellent. So E2M solutions for that route. Uh, and now we'll get back to talking to Drew at Connect OS. One of the things I want to uh, clarify for people listening is if, if I am an agency owner, I come to you guys uh, like Josh has, I say, hey, I need some staff to help me run some SEO campaigns or do some social media management. I'm employing the staff member. Um, I, pay, I pay you guys, you guys bill me, I pay you, you guys pay the staff member. 
Um, but I, I managing the staff member myself, right? It's not like I don't, I don't call Drew and say, "Hey, Drew, we need this campaign for a client. You go manage yeah, the staff." Yeah. I've got a direct relationship, and I'm managing the staff directly. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So just, just to add a few points to that, Troy. So exactly right. Where our responsibility is, we're sourcing them, screening them, interviewing them, and then, then you have your process interviews and whatever. Then once you're up and running. We're managing all the back ends, all of their payroll. We pay them on your behalf. Then when you get our invoice, you have a breakdown of that, um, all their IT setup, management around that. HR, if needed, um, again, that, that's on an as-needs basis. But they're exactly right. They're your staff. They report to you. They're part of the team, part of the culture. Just on the legals, Troy, so we, what, the way that will work is we would have a service agreement with our clients and then they're actually employed by us direct. So we have the, the employment agreement with the employee. Um, and then the, the service agreement. So, again, so you're, you're covered in terms of PI and risks and so forth. Um, but that, that's how we set that up, which I think is fairly common you know, across the industry. How, do you do you provide any advice to uh, people who are looking to hire someone but haven't really been through the recruitment process and don't really understand how to interview and what to look for? Do you, ha- do you provide any co- consulting or advice around that? Certainly on an ad hoc basis, yes. It's not, it's not a formal service we provide per se. Where, where um, And, again, I don't know if there, there'd be a lot of it out there, but but certainly, I mean, our, our, our process, and we, we certainly guide you through it. So as part of our onboarding, um, the client success manager, the relationship manager, we provide a full onboarding guide um, on, on how to do that, you know, how to – there is some common sense around it, meaning, you know, spending the, the right time up front. Um, common sense, they might sound occasionally where, you know, there, there can be – um, clients not getting the full value as they might not spend that initial, especially the first few days, painting the picture. This is who we are as a business. This is our brand. This is our culture. Really embedding that even in the first week just sets the tone um, for the first few months. So, we, again, we provide guides on that. Um, so I guess beyond that, the training would be more informal in a way, but but guided, guidance as needed, Troy. Yeah. How, do you, how do you, you know, because there is so much, you know, and I, I guess I'm looking at, clients that come to you that are new to this, how do you manage their expectations? Because one of the things I've found in the past is that people hire a remote staff member and they expect a unicorn. They expect someone who can do everything. And I've certainly made that mistake in the past when I was starting out as well because it was just a bit naive and a bit of inexperience. How do you manage those expectations to clients and kind of set their expectations and say, well, this is probably three roles, not yeah. one? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Troy, because it touches on the point I made earlier. We, we really... We are fully cognizant of the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have to deal with this perception of the industry. And beyond that, it is absolutely a space where we, we need to be nimble, right? So so how, how do we, we try and reassure that? We, we are very, very strong in our process. Um, and what do I mean by that? Like if we're not talking about IT, we're ISO 27 that doesn't want 1001 compliant. That, that, that gives people some reassurance. But also in those initial stages, really providing a lot of as requested to, but documentation so they can see from the from the go get, you know, we're not a backyard. Or we've got this is an overview of who we are. This is our IT policy and how that works. We provide a copy of our terms up front. You know, once they have the discovery that you can review before we get to formal T's and C's and signing off, so you can review that. Um, and that's quite involved, but just being as transparent as we can on this is what the process looks like. We provide guides. I mentioned onboarding, invoicing, and, and other things because. Because um, you're absolutely right, it, it can be a leap of faith for a lot of people that are new to it. It's a new space, um, legal and so forth. So as much as we can, we, we try to you know, offset that with providing the detail. Um, to your other point on, you know, wanting the unicorn, and occasionally, you know, we we we, we have when I say occasionally, where where we need to push back, we have done. But most of the time, the expectations are pretty pretty solid on what you can get versus what the what might be needed. But marketing is a good example where we've had requests for what I would call very senior strategic marketing roles that need an understanding of the local market. Now, the Philippines very different market to Australia for obvious reasons. So, if some of those we would actually push back and say, "Well, no, some of that, I guess, more senior skill set that should probably remain locally, or, or that's not what we would provide." What we can provide is, I guess, the the mid tier experience. You know, being a, a managing the day-to-day, providing content, you know, managing SEO and so forth, which, which doesn't lead, need local um, knowledge of the market. Um, this is and I guess for the – because this is, this, is this, is, this is probably – this is – I think this is where the clients that we work with, I think this is exactly where they get stuck, right, is they – and I, I've, we've got a lot of clients now who kind of have this um, strategist – 
implementer division, right? So they have they have strategists locally who are working with the clients to come up with solutions, design strategies. They understand the local market. They understand the, the local environment. They've got their finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening with competition, um, the local landscape, any compliance or new legislation that's happening. And then they design the strategy and then the implementers will – will run the day to day and keep everything keep everything running and we'll obviously give feedback to the strategist but I think and and that's been a very successful model for a lot of our clients but I think some clients expect well why can't I hire a strategist in the Philippines to get on the phone with the client and design the whole solution I, I, I know why that's problematic, but I wonder if you can just talk to that for a minute so yeah. that people can hear it from someone who's got that experience firsthand. Yeah. No, no, yeah, look at that, and especially in the startup space, right? You're, you're wanting to grow, and I, I, I've, I've, again, I was general manager of a startup, um, and and managing an admin team. So, it's there is some nuance to it, Troy. I think because again, you can get very senior, really, really smart, commercially smart, you know, nimble people in the Philippines, and I've seen them in ops roles and managed them directly. They're fantastic. Um, I would. Almost, you could approach, use that functional approach, but just thinking about what, what's your core IP in your business, right? What's your, um, and I, I guess I'm thinking about it in terms of what's realistic to outsource, but what, where are you taking too much of a risk, especially to a startup on outsourcing strategy or IP? Some of those really high end functions where um, the marketing is the best example where you need. Um, you know, you need not certain local knowledge you ain't necessarily going to get in the Philippines. I think on the, on the financial side, again, I, I this has probably very rarely come up, but if it's, you know, there's a difference between, sure, even being a senior senior accountant or, or managing senior tasks versus, you know, cash flow planning in your business or, or some of those really important risk management aspects that I personally would would wouldn't be comfortable outsourcing beyond a point because it's a critical function that that needs some of that nuance. There's maybe an argument on the financial side if someone's good enough they could still do that. But um, the, the way I, I would look at it is, I guess, starting with the outcomes, think, okay, you want to grow, you want senior people focusing on high-value tasks, and I guess drawing the line on what, what relates to your specific IP, um, you know, financially, where is it really a a commercial decision maker for a business owner come partner versus offshore, and that that could be one way to approach it. Um, hope I've answered your question, Troy, because it's yeah. a great question, and, and it's not a. I don't think it's necessarily a straight click on answer. To no, it. it's not. And I, I yeah. think I, I think some people just have to learn the hard way. They try and yeah. they try and outsource tasks that will you know bite them in the bum because they haven't heeded the warning. And I think and and certainly I've I've had my expectations have had to be reset and managed over the years, and not just with remote staff, but with local staff as well. Um, uh, the what, so so if I'm an agency owner, what kind of talent should I be looking to recruit in the Philippines, whether it's through you, through you guys or someone else? What what can I expect that I can outsource and and get uh, get a remote team member to help me with? What are the typical yeah. roles that you're looking at, at recruiting for? Yeah, yeah, great question. So look, we're working through it. Probably starting with the um, the most common would be administration. So and that, that's and I often talk about administration. Um, role, Troy, that there's almost three tiers to it. It's a good way to look at it because it it is the most common and it's also the most common as a hybrid. So I mentioned earlier you can have, you know, someone as a marketing manager, hybrid with an admin, bookkeeper, hybrid admin, and that, that's a very common. Um, but within admin, for example, the three tiers could be the lower level data entry, like really basic data entry, entering fields in an application. A mid-tier might be more what we typically hire, general admin tasks, back office administration process and so forth. And then I'd describe a senior as someone who, you know, we've seen examples of admin staff coordinating rostering for staff, um, field reps in the field, and they're, they're coordinating and resource managing around that. So they're quite, you know, project managing effectively. That, that'll be the senior level. But but that'll be the, the first and most common um, admin. Um, accounting, come bookkeeping is another broad bucket. So, so, you know, basic bookkeeping up to, you know, literally logging into the, in our case, the ATO portal to, to lodge statements and so forth. Um, IT would be another large bucket. Again, in the in the startup space, um, that they can be you know basic back end IT, um, and then you know more established businesses, anything from uh, devs, you know front end, back end devs, full stack, you know some of those that, um, and you do certainly see spikes depending on where the market's at for, for industry needs. Um, you know, I've mentioned social media marketing manager will be another another bucket um, that that again we've seen quite a quite a trend in that in the last six months actually. It's, there seems to be a lot of need for that. 
And beyond that, Troy, I guess you get these more, you know, niche technical roles. So drafting, you know, in construction, engineering could be one example. Estimators could be another. And they're, they're sort of within that broad sort of um, ad hoc technical, or let's call it, um, you get these different niches within that. And for just in marketing, what roles, apart from strategy, mm. what roles should I – uh, what roles would you say, well, well, that's probably not something – like so the two and, – and I'm more than happy for you to challenge me on this. Mm. My experience would say the two roles I've found very difficult to hire for, specifically in the Philippines, are design and copywriting. Yeah. Should I be – should I be? Should I not bother trying to do that or, or have I missed something over the years and, and not found the right talent? I'll start with the copyright because it's interesting you say that. We've actually sourced – some of those roles um, lately, and 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 done, done it very well for for content based organisations. Um, so so look, assurance me that we've absolutely seen that. I haven't seen a, an avalanche of it. It's a bit of a niche role, but I've certainly and we've we've done it successfully. Um, I think common sense around that, Troy. It's certainly, you know, you, you'd be paying well for what the market offers. You've got to do all the right things to get the right candidates. So I think those those you, you can get. Um, on the the design thing, I think that's that to me. It would depend, but I would say some of it could potentially relate to my comments on the senior marketing. If it's design, where again the, the Philippines and as I said, the Asian region, very different market, and, and tastes vary. We've seen graphic design roles absolutely. I mean, graphic design is, is a, you know, it's a niche role, but we see it quite quite regularly. Let's put it that way. Um, but I would say, again, if you're looking for a strategist on design to sort of set the design, set the strategy, and then design based on that. Maybe that's something you might be just careful about, but certainly basic graphic design roles. Um, yeah, we see a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've actually said, I've actually had seen some great video editors come out of the Philippines as well, which is not something that I expected. Um, yeah. Uh, and but I will say that they are harder to find than a web developer or a full stack software developer yep. or an admin assistant. Um, I agree. And I don't know why, but uh, the the creative roles I think are harder to find. I think the talent pool might be. Uh, smaller there, and also I, I think you're right that the aesthetic and the taste and the market in right across Asia is actually is quite different to what I've experienced in Australia. And you just go to Asia and you have a look at the the graphic design and the billboards and the pamphlets and the brochures, and you can see that it's a completely different kind of uh, uh, aesthetic. And so I think a creative talent in the Philippines that are serving Australian or New Zealand companies the ones that I've seen work really well are ones that have studied what's going on in the Australian New Zealand market and have had a look at what other companies are uh, producing and have adapted their style accordingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that just on that, Troy, it's, it's again, common sense, but if you, you know, you, you put some fairly tight parameters on that. So exactly. If you are, you know, take what I get said earlier, that, that yeah, you want to use a bit of common sense on, on some of that senior, senior experience, but if you say, okay, well, I want someone who has that Australian experience, as you say, on a fairly niche it is a niche role. Um, you, you can find them, yeah. Apart from uh, design agencies and marketing agencies, who's the typical client that comes to you guys? It's – we have it, – it is quite broad. I mean, I – you know, the – I mean, we we have a broad cross-section. I mean, yes, certainly within finance and accounting, you do see a, a mix of sort of SMEs to mid- mid-tiers, I guess, but um, – you know, I'd, I'd almost the way I describe rather than using industries, for example, you see quite a lot of start, startups. You know, lean, um, let's say less than five year startups. See a lot of that, even under ten years where they're really sharp, but they're still technically a startup, and they're they're looking at, um, I guess, some of these more generalist roles. So you know, in marketing and doing a little bit of SEO, a bit of digital marketing. Had one of those this morning actually, where you know a little bit of admin. So that that's a very common um, bucket. But then you know, we're also given the, I guess, where the business is heading, we're having a lot of larger clients that, that will literally say to us, we need a lot of staff um, in, let's say, an administration-type role in a short short time frame. So we're, um, as a business, I guess, we're, we've stretched to that as well, where there might be some capability presentations initially and stakeholders and so forth. And then in, in the mid-tier, I typically, I must say, dealing with a lot of startups and sort of mid-tiers, Troy, that the moment is just that that's the way it's sort of panned out. Um, which is great, but I guess it's just a different type of conversation where, as I say, more generalist, I guess, for those those smaller entities, understandably, and then they they grow. And the other point I make on this, this is a good insight to share, actually, that um, especially if you're looking at growing out a team, you know, spending the time on thinking about what those one or two initial roles look like is a really important point because often they become initially what could be an ops role in the trenches 
for a future team lead of, you know, four or five staff. So firstly, getting those one or two roles right, initial roles is absolutely critical, but also understanding that that's probably going to evolve into a, you know, a gun, ops, tech, whatever it might be, into a, into a team lead. So that adds another layer of, you know, and we, we feel we can absolutely help with that, but something to bear in mind, just thinking about, you know, that future yeah, skill set, if you like. Yeah, and across all the industries that you serve and the 1,200-odd staff that you've got, what have you seen um, work uh, uh, with those that have been successful versus those that uh, have had a team member that hasn't worked out for whatever reason? What are the traits of those that are doing it really well? What are the sort of the common characteristics that they're displaying? Yep, I I think personally... Um, and I'll use the common sense again, but a bit easier. And spending the time up front, so especially in that first week, you know, painting a picture of this is who we are as a business, this is our culture, because that, that's what you're doing. You're bringing them in on the journey. And I think I would add to that, Troy, it's not that it's with the, the absence of this means you're not being successful. But companies, I guess, seem to have a natural, um, they appreciate that we look after our people, right? So I was going to say HR, but it's not a HR focus. It's just if you're really sort of people um, focused on what you do and looking after your people. That's our, our model does seem to resonate and it just sets the tone, right? That if you think about the overall experience for the for the employee in the Philippines, they're coming into a company at our end, they're in a nice environment. If they're working in the office, there's a lot of the things we're doing on that end. Client they're working for again is setting the tone. They're very focused on staff well being, building that relationship and just setting that tone, especially in the first few weeks, uh, I often say that doing that, they become I guess, much more independent in the context of the business they're working for if you spend that time up front. I'm sure this is common sense stuff for a lot of your listeners, but um, just setting that tone early, I think, is a bit of a bit of a no-brainer. Um, um, it, it is common sense, but it's not, well, I, I, I would know, say it's I, common I, sense, but it's not common practice. Right? Indeed. <laughs> you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's why I shouldn't qualify that too heavily because you do see the uh, – I've seen it really, but this is this sort of set and forget. And then you know, a few weeks in, there's a bit of a misperception. We do our best to communicate that, but yeah, there can be that expectation. That I think the other thing, the other thing I think that's worth noting is like te- new new team members generally, you know, by and large, they don't want to be a nuisance. They want to fit in. They want to be useful. They want to be helpful. They they a lot of people don't feel comfortable asking a lot of questions in the first you know, 14 to 30 days that they're employed. They want to try and figure things out themselves and kind of, you know, be competent. Add to that the the culture of the Philippines is I think what I've learned over the years is that you have to be overtly explicit in making it okay for people to ask lots of questions and let them know that that yeah. is the right thing to do because their culture is – that they, they they just they won't be as forthcoming as I said. Any new team member, regardless of where they live, will want to figure things out themselves and and right. and make an impact and make an impression. But particularly in the Philippine culture, they're very proud. They do uh, you know they do they don't want to be seen as uh, as not competent or not be able to do the job. And so you you, I th- you think you really need to lean into people and let them know it's totally okay to ask lots of questions. We'd rather yeah. you ask lots of questions up front and get clarity than than go off and do the wrong thing. How, what, what, I'm curious, obviously you don't train the staff how to do the job they've been hired for, but what do you do, how do you keep the staff that work in the facility, in the, in the office there, how, what do you do to maintain that culture and to kind of, you know, um, nurture them as good employees and good well, team members? Yeah, great, great couple of questions. And I'm glad you raised the point on the the cultural differences, Troy, because it, it's a very valid point. And as you say, that that they 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 tend to be more, um, what's the word? It's not, you know, more um, not, not subservient. It's, it's like not as um, they might be quieter when they should maybe raise something. Is that perception right? Or a bit more. I I per- that is still a, it's a very important point to lodge. I think it's actually softened a bit in the last say ten years. And the reason I say that it's still there and it's something you have to acknowledge. But um, I just think they this is my perception, but they, it's, it's such a big market over there, and I think the understanding of the differences and nuances with Australian culture versus the Philippines, um, I think, has improved. Where you, you do the, the the gap is, I think, compared to when I was doing it in 2010, um, it, it's you know the lines are, are a bit bit less less uh, clear. If that makes sense, or it's getting closer. Um, it, how do we do that and, and create that culture? So. You know, I, I touched on this, but 
you know, we, we do have this this very strong HR-driven focus in our business. So I mentioned the, uh, the office and, you know, monthly and monthly team building events and so forth. It's worth mentioning the Christmas event, um, Troy, because you, you probably know, but in the Philippines, the Christmas party is a very, very different thing to what it is um, in Australia in that um, it is absolutely a culture-building exercise, right? So in Australia, we, we organise an event and organise drinks and whatever, but over there, um, to give you an idea, we have, I think we, we're potentially looking at close to a 1,000 people at our, our Christmas event this year. And it's it's really about the team. It's not about the management. Clients, off, we encourage clients to come. They're not obliged to. Um, but it's a it's a big night. It's, it's a, you know, um, we have performers and so forth and the staff win prizes. But but it just, it, it really is as a, as, a, as a business and as a team, the staff love that. So we put a lot of energy, time, money and resource into that. Um, beyond that, I, I think... I've lost my train of thought. There was something else I was going to say, and I've lost my train of thought. But you know, the the, the monthly things are, are really important, and hopefully that's, that cements that. Um, you know, it, I mean, this is a little thing, but doing the, the staff benefits, so having an employee, um, uh, you know, benefits program, having the, the, the healthcare and some of those things too. And that should be standard. Unfortunately, it's not in our space. And some of the providers don't don't include healthcare, which is a big deal over there, of course. So I think all of those pieces do do, do add up. Um, you know, we, we, we do actively encourage clients if they ever want to visit the Philippines. Again, they don't have to, but if they do, because, again, building that relationship with your staff so we can arrange, pick up at the airport, accommodation, vice versa. Some staff have visited Australian businesses to build that relationship. So, again, I, I just need to emphasise it's not an expectation to do it, but just those little things can help. You know? Yeah, incredibly beneficial. I, I, it, it changed the game for us when I went to Manila and met our staff. Um the, is there much is there much interaction with the team members that work for different companies, but they work in the same office? Do they form friendships and they have that kind of sense of camaraderie in that office space? Absolutely. So, I mean, to give you an idea, the, the team in the office they they they'd be sitting next to each other. There is a team, so they they learn by osmosis. Um, that there's a lot of those things. So again, they, these you know I call them team building activities. So they are grouped together based based on industry. So again, there's a lot of you know. Um, you know, and we allocate significant resource to that. So there's there's a there's a big, you know, the, the CSMs, our, our relationship managers, have their own sort of events as well. And um, you know, we've put a lot of, you know, with that, like it's terribly terrible. I guess on the back end, re- resourcing of that. So you're know, getting transparency on on where the business is at, where there's a need to Troy. So you know, we've recently had a major upgrade in our, our systems. Um, HRI system and and what that basically gives us is more visibility over where where there's a need right so where the, where do we need more more stuff more resources and so forth and that's sort of slightly on a tangent but it again relates back to staff feeling supported right and what they're doing both in a work sense and and having the, these team building activities so because I get you know one of the other things is if you're living in Australia or New Zealand you've got staff in the Philippines and they're overwhelmed or you, they've just got too much work. They won't be the first to put their hand up and say, "Hey, you know, I need some help." How do you how do you manage that, and how do you become aware of that? And then do you go back to clients and say, "Hey, you need to hire some more people"? Yeah, well, probably in the initial stages. I mean, I, I tend to find because our process typically is look like, often I'm having the initial conversation, it might be an equivalent, my equivalent, if you like, um, and then we get into the process, right? So we we go through and sourcing and so forth, and then it's really the the, the CSM relationship managers managing the data today on there as needed. So where, Troy, I, I tend to watch really closely is in that first three months, right? Um, we're dealing with people, so occasionally there can be misalignment. That happens in any business in the world that, that is involving in the sourcing of people. So we've got to watch that very, very carefully, um, both from an, an expectations point of view or occasionally, again, if there is misalignment, we have to, you know, be on the front foot, if you like, in managing that. Um Beyond that, I, 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 it's interesting. I, I don't tend to find we we are dealing with any way a uh, situation where staff's been there for let's say six or twelve months, and we're having reports from their team that they're absolutely inundated, and you know, it does it doesn't tend to happen that way for us. Um, you know, we absolutely notice where there's a workload. They'll come to us. We need more staff because it's growing. We see that a lot, um, but it, but it isn't something we, we've we've had to had to deal with. I like to think again. You know the employee benefits, and and we very strong HR focus internally. We watch that pretty closely, actually. Um, so employee wellbeing is something we, we monitor very 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 carefully. Um, but as I say, touch wood, it hasn't been something we, we've had to. You know the scenario you think where it's where it's 
major benefit after 12 months, we've got to, got to fill that gap. It's which one's pretty close. And it's a fair to clients are pretty good like that. I think that they, they, once they understand the model and the roles tend to grow over time, especially the admin's a good example where they start with a, a core focus and then over time they realise, okay, great, we can also delegate, you know. But it, it seems most clients don't understand the um, parameters of that. Yeah. What are you most excited about in this space over the, you know, now that we're out of COVID, we've kind of come back to, you know, some kind of new version of normal. It's still a very much a remote workforce. Half the buildings here in Melbourne are empty. I yeah. imagine commercial real estate in the city is going to become pretty cheap over the next five years as people yeah. are just refusing to go back to the office. You know, what are you most excited about over the coming years? Great question. I think, look, I... I guess I'll, I'll, I'll approach it from two points of view. One, one's, I guess, from a, a Philippines base, and then maybe from an Australian centric point of view. I think, you know, we we like we are building really good relationships with our clients, and it's, it is gratifying when you come back and you get that feedback. They're really happy with the process, and all the pieces are, are doing really well. Um, so, absolutely, I'm excited in terms of some of these relationships we've developed, especially the last 12, 18 months post COVID, um, where typically we, we build that trust. And then great. Now when you do, you know, really, really expand out. That, that of course that excites me. That that's you know, business development, and it's exciting for any business to see that. And as I say, Troy, we, we really are working very hard behind the scenes to manage that growth. You know, quality can be suffer when you have that. So all the back end resourcing and and really us, you know, not being complacent as that grows. Look, I think from an Australian point of view, I'm a, I'm a mad, very patriotic Australian, and my my view on this is that more and more Australian businesses need to you know, look at this as an option because, as I say, we, we very commonly see businesses grow locally. So when you, you do free up your senior people or, or high-value resources to do the things they're good at and focus on the high-value tools, business tends to grow anyway, right? So I think from an Australian point of view, it's actually a really positive thing. They tend to grow locally, it creates more jobs because of these sorts of initiatives. So I'm a huge believer in that, yeah. Awesome. Drew, it's been great having you on the Agency Hour podcast. Where can people reach out and say thanks and get in touch and explore the possibility of working with you guys? Yep, thank you. So, yeah, Connect OS. So, you'll, you'll see it's just Google Connect OS, one word, on our site. You can, um, they can obviously reach out to me direct. It's, it's basically my name, or well, I can sure provide the details. But, um, and yeah, happy to have a conversation if people are, are really exploring that. Quite often, we have, we have a chat. It's not necessarily there's a need now, but I'm happy to, happy to have that conversation if people want, want to learn more. Thanks, and we'll put links in the show notes, of course, underneath this episode. So uh, check yeah. out connectos.co. We have clients who are clients of ConnectOS. We share clients. So uh, we uh, think that it's a good idea that you have a, a chat with them if you want to go down that path and know that, as I said, we have mastermind clients who are in this space and are using Connect uh, OS and having a lot of success. So they come highly recommended. Thanks for spending some time with us. I'm glad we connected and I look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thanks, Troy. Thanks for the invitation. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Agency Hour podcast and a massive thanks to Drew for joining us. I really enjoyed chatting with him and I could chat for hours with him about growing teams, maintaining and nurturing a strong culture and all that good stuff. Okay, folks, please don't forget to subscribe and please share this with anyone who you think may need to hear it. I'm Troy Dean and remember, dragonflies have six legs but can't walk. <laughs> <laughs>